Hi, future scientists. My name is John, and today we're going to be building and experimenting with a fire tornado to try and understand what a nerve signal is uh, and how it works. Today we're going to model a nerve signal with a fire tornado, and to really understand what's going on, we're going to talk about ions, we're going to connect things like voltage to pressure, uh, and ultimately try and explain what an action potential is. And an action potential is just another word for the nerve signals that help your brain control your limbs uh, and help you sense the world around you. The signals from like, touching and smelling and seeing uh, that get re relayed back to your brain. So the first thing I wanna tell you about is ions. And an ion is just an atom or molecule that has a, a charge. Uh, and this could be something like sodium, sodium and potassium that have lost an electron. So now they're positively charged. It could be something like chloride ions that have gained an electron and now they have a negative charge. Uh, and it could also be something like lithium uh, that's found in your cell phone battery. Now, voltage is the word used to describe different configurations of charges. Uh, because, well, like charges repel. So if you have two positive charges that are close together and then they move apart, that's different. One's higher energy, one's lower energy. And scientists like a word to describe how those are different, how those configurations of charges are different, and that word is voltage. And it happens to be for things like two protons or two sodium ions moving from about one nanometer apart, a tiny, tiny, tiny distance, to three nanometers apart is about one volt. I, here's another example of reconfiguring charges. If you take a lithium ion and an electron and some graphite, C6, and combine those together, uh, that's a difference of about three volts. And just a third example, your cells. The human cells, especially things like neurons, uh, regulate ions inside and outside of the cells. They have pumps and channels and transporters that move ions around. And here you can see that this is an example like sodium where there's 15 times more outside of the cell as inside. That configuration of charges also sets up a voltage difference. Uh, a description of how that energy is different uh, if those charges were allowed to move. All right. So that's what voltage is. It's a configuration of charges. Unfortunately, charges are hard to see. It's hard to you know, look at a, a single neuron uh, and try and understand exactly what's happening in those cells of our brain and in our nervous system. So voltage differences can move charges and ions and pressure differences can move liquids and gases. And I'm gonna show you a couple quick demos to try and bring that comparison to life. What you see here is a battery and I have a wire and I'm gonna connect the negative end of this battery uh, to the positive end. And this is a really weak battery. It's about one and a half volts. And you can see there's a tiny, tiny spark. It's just a barely a orangish glow. Uh, don't try this at home. We're short circuiting a battery. This is dangerous. Uh, the battery can overheat uh, and start a fire. Uh, and now that's pretty weak. That's one and a half volts. Let's try something bigger. Once again, don't try this at home, but now we have three, four nine volt batteries connected in series. So this is 36 volts. And now if I connect these, uh, you can see we get a much bigger spark. Uh, we see a lot more electrons flowing uh, between the two ends of this battery. So big voltage differences can result in a big flow of electrons and charges. Again, don't try this at home. So voltage differences uh, come about from an arrangement of charges. Pressure differences can come about, uh, in this case, by having a height of liquid. So if the height of the liquid is the same, I have a hole here on the side, if the height of the liquid is the same as the hole, not a lot leaks out. But if we have a column, 
we have some height of liquid here above the hole, we get a little bit of pressure. And you can see that the liquid is actually flying out pretty fast. And as that starts to drain, what you'll notice is well, the stream actually starts to bend uh, less and less. It's coming out slower and slower. And you can see how weak and slow that is. And this is just like the 1.5 volt battery. We just had a really weak flow of electrons between the two ends. And next, what I'm gonna do is fill this bottle up all the way uh, and see if we can get a much stronger flow of liquid. All right, here we have a full bottle and that's a lot of liquid up above this hole. And just like diving to the deep end of a swimming pool, there's a lot of pressure. You can feel it on your ears. And here you can see that big pressure uh, right, so instead of a really weak stream that was falling straight down, now we have a much more powerful stream. Uh, and this is just like the 36 volt battery that was creating a big flow of electrons, a big flow of charges that we could see as sparks. So a voltage difference can move charges and ions, and we saw a little voltage difference moves a little bit of charge and we saw just like an orangish glow and a big voltage difference moves a lot of charge and we saw a bright white spark. Uh, the same thing's true with pressure differences. A little pressure difference, in this case from the height of the liquid, uh, created a little trickle of liquid, uh, but a big pressure difference from a really tall uh, amount of liquid results in a really big pressure difference and a really strong stream. Uh, and now let's take this one step further. And I'm gonna talk about a different way that we can create pressure differences. Uh, and that's with moving air. So this is sort of a fun demo uh, that all you need is a strip of paper. So if you hold it just like is pictured and blow right over the top of the piece of paper, it actually lifts it up. Uh, this is just like an airplane wing, actually. Air in motion uh, is lower pressure, and it cre can create lift. Yeah, cool. So that's one way to create a pressure difference. And the next one I want to talk about, we're going to do by rotating uh, a window screen that I've woven into a cylinder. And, well, we're also going to add a little bit of fire. Please do not try this at home. What you see here is a rotating plate. I have a glass bowl in it, and it's filled with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. And we're gonna start it on fire. And what I'm gonna do is add this screen to it, and we're gonna get it spinning. And just like by blowing over a strip of paper before, now by rotating the cylinder, we're gonna get air moving inside of it, and it's gonna create a pressure difference. Uh, and in this case, it's actually going to oxygenate the fire. Uh, and we're going to see if we can take a little bit of energy from the fire and get it to propagate uh, the full length of this tube, of the cylinder. Right. Put on my safety glasses. Uh, don't try this at home. I'm in a well-ventilated room. I have a second person nearby with a fire extinguisher. So here's my little fire. It's about, well, I guess it's licking up to about 12 inches, but it's around, I don't know, four, five, six inches on average. And if you spin a fire, what do you do? Not a lot of times. Uh, but I'm going to wedge this in nice and tight. When we spin this, you can see a little bit of fire down here actually gains energy. A pressure difference can feed it. And it grows. It's a little bit wobbly. Yeah, cool. 
Let me see if I can back it up a little bit. Yeah, cool. So here a pressure difference is creating a much bigger fire, but it's also directing which direction that fire spreads down the length of the column. So let me tell you again what we just did. We rotated that screen. Uh, the rotating air, uh, it was also heated, created something like a helix that I'm showing with these red arrows inside the cylinder. Uh, that rotating and rising air was air in motion. And that has a low pressure. And there's relatively still air outside. And that pressure difference actually oxygenated the fire and created a fire tornado. And what's cool about that is that's just like what's happening inside your nerves. In that case, instead of a fire, it's a little bit of a signal. It could be from your vision, could be from hearing, uh, it could be from a neighboring cell that's starting a signal. And instead of moving down a wire mesh cylinder, uh, like on a screen window, it's moving down the length of the cell called an axon that carries these signals long range. And that's called an action potential. Uh, what's cool about these action potentials is that they can move really fast, up to 100 miles per hour. Uh, and where does this energy come from? Well, we know already that there's this potential difference because of how ions and charges are arranged inside a cell. Um, more outside, more inside, depending on the type of ion that you're talking about. Uh, and that's a source of energy. But there's still this question of why is it so fast? Because each little ion, they're absolutely tiny. These are just single atoms um, in the case of, well, things like sodium and potassium and chloride. Uh, and they're moving really, really slow. They're bouncing around with water molecules and other ions, and they're just moving at something like 10 nanometers per second. So how can they go millions of times faster to have a 100 mile per, per hour signal? And I'd like to show you that with just a quick little demo. So here I have a paper towel tube. Uh, it's empty. And what I have is a bunch of ions uh, that I've made out of tin foil. And what I'm gonna do is load this up uh, with a bunch of them. And what you can see happen is that now that the tube is full, whenever I add an ion, well, one pops out the other side. And when I add one more ion, another one pops out the, the other side. And if I add an ion, one pops out the other side. So what you just saw was tin foil balls going into a tube. And every single ball that we put in there, there the size of those tin foil balls was about three centimeters. So as I pushed one in, it pushed its neighbor, and it pushed its neighbor, and it push, pushed its neighbor, and the speed of each ball was about three centimeters per second. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. I was just popping these tinfoil balls in the tube. Uh, but what's pretty cool is that once it's full and they're all in contact, colliding with their neighbors, that when I put that first ball in and this 11th ball pops out the other end, the speed of that signal, how fast one pushed into one end could force the other one at the far end to come out was actually much faster, something like 30 centimeters per second uh, if there was 10 balls. And you can scale that up if you just have a bigger tube, right? So here's a much, much bigger tube and well, the sky's the limit. If you have something like an axon, uh, of a nerve cell uh, that can be very long, extending all the way down to your fingertips and your toes, all of those ions colliding with their neighbors inside that tube, fed by the energy of that voltage difference, uh, that configuration of ions outside of the cell and inside of the cell, can keep that signal propagating or moving all the way along these really long tubes, just like a fire tornado where a little bit of fire can actually travel a long distance fed by, well, not a pressure difference, but a voltage difference. Thanks for watching.
Hi, I'm Steph. And I'm Kate. And we work at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. And we're interested in understanding how our brains use electricity to communicate with the rest of the body and interact with the rest of the world. So um, when people were first starting to think about how the brain communicated with and controlled the rest of the body, there were two hypotheses, the chemical hypothesis and the electrical hypothesis. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about the difference in speed between those two. And we're going to do that using this uh, beaker full of water with a drop of food coloring to illustrate how long it might take for a chemical to diffuse through something that's mostly water, like our bodies. Um, and we'll also ask you to think about, you know, for example, the length of your arm in comparison to this beaker and how long it normally takes for a command from your brain to travel to your fingers, for example, and see whether those two things are compatible. And what you'll see is that if we put uh, drops of red food coloring in, this actually takes quite a long time for the chemical to diffuse uh, through this link, which means biology and our bodies, in order to get us this big, needed to have a way to solve that problem or else we needed to wait this long before our fingers would know something that our brain had just told us to do. So now as you're watching the dye that's, you know, making its way through the water, how long do you think it'll take from it to get to the top, from the top to the bottom? the time that we have to calculate how long that'll take and then you could use that same calculation to see how long it takes you to react to certain things. So the way we're going to do this is using speeds and so in order to have a speed you have a distance per some amount of time and so in our case with the water we have a distance in centimeters. We know that the height of the water is 36 centimeters tall from the top to the bottom. We also know that it took about two minutes for the dye to diffuse. And we want to compare our number, our speed here, um, to some other fast things. And normally, fast things have the units of kilometers per hour if we're using the metric system, which we are here. Um, and so we're going to need to do some conversions. We can say that there are 60 minutes in one hour. We also know that there are 100 centimeters in one meter. And likewise, we know that there are 1,000 meters in one kilometer. So now, if we cross out the units that appear on both the top and the bottom, we get rid of the centimeters, we get rid of the minutes, we get rid of the meters, leaving us with kilometers per hour as our units. And now um, we can put this into the calculator or do it in your head if you're uh, so inclined. See if you can beat me with my calculator. And what we come up with is 0 0.0108 kilometers per hour. This would also translate to about 10 or 11 meters per hour. So we're not going all that fast <laughs> with diffusion. Um, and you can actually do similar calculations to this with your own reaction time by figuring out the distance that the information needs to travel to get from your brain to, for example, your hand, and the amount of time that it takes using a reaction time calculator. And see if your brain is slower or faster than <laughs> 10 <laughs> meters per hour. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay. 
we're going to now do the reaction time activity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to <laughs> have a little competition between me and Kate. Um, and and so if you want to join us, you can pull up the reaction time test uh, website, reactiontime.net, and choose the classic mode. And you can see if you beat both of us <laughs> um, as well. Okay, so average of five? Yes. Okay, are you ready? Okay. Set, go. Oh, okay, so I got three. The first one. Oh, I got <laughs> three, six, five milliseconds. Okay. Cool. Ooh, that was a good one. Woo! Ninety-six. Oh my god! Three twenty-six. <laughs> Steph is gonna win this one. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, that was bad for me. 285. 402. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I saw your green and I flinched. <laughs> 367. 376. <laughs> okay, last one. Yay. Ooh. Okay, three twenty. Three thirty nine. Okay. So let's see, my average was three twenty two, and mine was three sixty two. I mean, that's still pretty close. <laughs> that's still pretty close. <laughs> All right, the next thing we're going to look at is whether um, different things can change our reaction times, including the temperature of our muscles um, and how tired they are. So, <gasps> shall we? <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> okay, wait, do I wanna, I feel like we, we have to just, I think you re refresh. You have a fresh. Okay, good. And then it resets, I think. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, okay. So now um, we're going to start with the ice water challenge. We're each going to <laughs> put our hands in the bucket, which is full of ice and water. We're going to leave our hands there for one minute and then we're going to redo the reaction time test. Yep. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Ready? Go. <laughs> <I'm so good. laughs> okay, ready? Ready? <laughs> ready? I'm ready. Okay. over five for the normal uh, was 362 milliseconds. But with the ice, my average again over five was actually faster. So 344 milliseconds for my reaction time with the ice. Okay, I was not as quick as Kate with ice. My hand honestly still kind of hurts. <laughs> But my average was 488. That's a lot slower than last yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, so the question for you is, are you more like Steph? Does the cold make you slower? <laughs> or are you more like me and the cold makes you faster? And if you don't want to do ice as the thing that, you know, uh, your external factor to affect your muscles, you could always do something like 
grab like a stress ball or like, you know, anything you can squeeze and squeeze it really, really hard, as hard as you can for a minute. And then see after that, you know, how fast is your reaction time? Because now you're looking to see if muscle fatigue, right? Like you've used your muscles, you're working it really hard. How fast are you still able to react? So yeah, give it a go, have some fun. <laughs> So the brain, uh, in order to communicate with the rest of the body, uses electrical signals sent through all your nerves throughout your body to communicate with your muscles and all your organs. Um, and specifically with muscles, when it receives electrical input from your brain, you're able to move your hands and grab something um, and, and do all these you know, kinds of fun things that you can do just by moving around. And actually, we have the capability to measure the electricity that your brain is sending to your muscles. And we're going to do an activity now um, where you'll be able to hear um, sound that's produced based on the amount of electricity that our brains are sending to our muscles. All right. So now we are going to show you um, how we can actually measure the electricity that your uh, brain is sending as a signal to your muscles in order to get them to contract. And to do this, we're going to use this small box, which is called an amplifier. And if you're interested in building your own amplifier, um, you can go to backyardbrains.com and uh, check out their instructions and their kits. And um, so what this is going to do is it is also connected to some electrodes, which we are going to use um, to measure um, the electricity that your body is producing and sends the signal to the amplifier, which amplifies um, this electrical signal and turns it into a sound that we can actually hear. We're gonna be using some uh, electrode gel to help us in increase the um, conductivity of our skin. And we're also gonna be using some electrode beads, which are pretty similar to those used in uh, medical settings. Okay, so I'm going to put these electrodes on my arm and we're going to measure my electrical activity in my muscles. Sticks nicely. <laughs> I think that's okay. This is the ground electrode. I want just going to hang out on my arm. It helps us know what the reference is on Steph's body. All right. So now Steph has the electrodes on her arm. They're connected to our amplifier. Here, there's like a kind of stronger whooshing noise that the amplifier makes when I um, curl my bicep. So I'll do it again and see if you can hear it. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you from these electrodes that are connected to my arm how we can measure the electrical activity from our muscles. Here, we have our electricity source. And so with this uh, little box, you can control uh, the frequency of electric pulses that you can administer through these cables, which we're gonna attach, cables. And then we're gonna attach it to 
these popsicle sticks with brass bolts because brass brass is you know uh, the material is able to conduct electricity well and make good contact with your skin um, and we'll also be using this electrolyte gel that you use uh, to help increase the conductivity of your skin. Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna plug it in. Yeah. So I'm gonna use the gel to improve conductivity. It's just gel with salt in it, essentially. Okay. And so I'm gonna turn on our electrical power source, turn it up a little. Let me know when you feel so. I, yeah. So I'm starting tingling? to feel, yeah, little, little pulses of tingling. Okay, so we're gonna turn it up a little more. And so now you can see that my hand is starting to move. And that's not something that I'm doing. And it's actually not something that I can stop, even if I try. If I try to hold my finger and thumb still, I cannot do it. But if I remove the sticks from my arm, breaking the connection, now I'm in control of my hand again. My brain's electricity is sending the signals. But if I put it back here, now Steph's box is sending the electric signals to my muscle and my, completely overriding what my brain is trying to do. So I know we can see it on the side. Let's see if we can see it from the front. Yeah. And when Kate removes them, stop. I control my hand. When I put back, I can't make it stop no matter how hard I try. Oh, cool, right? It's very strange. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's still so weird. It's so strange. I have a point. And it looks different. Everyone, everyone's... Do you want to... Um, should we, should yeah. we demonstrate on you, too? Just, you know... So because like, everyone's body, we all have the same muscles and generally the same um you know structure but everyone's body is a little different and so you know the same place i put these electrodes will feel different on me than it did on kate and move different muscles so here we can put up some gel uh, there's a spot that i know that does real crazy <laughs> like my whole hand just goes wow okay so let's see okay. I will, I will do the, and it's this mm -hmm. one? Yep. So I'm going to put this right until I do feel the tingling. Oh, yeah, a little bit of tingling. Okay. Oh. oh, yeah, I saw your pinky go a little bit there. Wow. Whole hand. Yes, you can see where for me it was just my finger and thumb. Steph is actually getting part of the palm of her hand to move. But and then I remove it, and I can move my hand again. But then I put it back. Ooh. Yeah. And it, like my hand gets all filled up too. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and you just, you can't resist it. Nope, no, oh my gosh. And it's, you feel the tingly sensation of, <laughs> it's electricity mm -hmm. going into your hand throughout, you know, your whole fingertips and everything. It's pretty crazy. Yes. Okay, cool. So that's how um, we, that's one way that we can show that your muscles rely on electric signals from your brain in order to tell them to move. Thank you so much for joining us today. We had a great time showing you some cool things about electricity and the brain. And if you have any other questions, uh, join us on our live Q&A for Take Your Child to Work Day. And we look forward to seeing you there. Bye.